Well, this is DW News live from Berlin. You've been watching the one and only debate between the two people who would like to lead the next German government after the national election on September 24th. Chancellor Angela Merkel, the incumbent and the candidate who wants her job, Martin Schulz, faced off 90 minutes fielding questions, topics such as immigration, social justice, North Korea, relations to U.S. President Trump, and even the question, were you in church this Sunday? More often than not, it seemed both candidates were in agreement, even in unison, a TV duel that felt somewhat like a TV duet. I want to pull in now two people here at the big table with me to talk about this duel or duet we saw tonight. <laughs> Melinda Crane is our chief political correspondent and Torsten Benner of the Global Public Policy Institute here in Berlin. So what did we get tonight? Did we, first of all, did we get a true debate going or were they on the same page most of the time? I have about three pages of notes here, both sides, and I just looked, and on every page, at least one time, I've underlined either Angela Merkel agrees with him or he agrees with Angela Merkel. Of the issues they discussed, definitely they were in more or less in agreement on the majority of them. There were a couple of points of, of strong disagreement. For example, what to do with Turkey. Mm -hmm. Foreign policy made up a fairly small section of the debate as a whole, yeah. but it was very clear that Martin Schulz, at least what he's saying now, is he would break off membership negotiations now with Turkey, whereas the chancellor wants to keep her diplomatic options at least to some degree open. Mm -hmm. The only other point they were, where at least according to my take on matters, where they were really strongly in, uh, at least went head to head, was on the question of what's going to happen with pensions. The uh, SPD rival to the chancellor says, if the CDU continues with its policy, people are going to be working till they're 70 because the numbers don't add up. Mm -hmm. He says that his government, if he were leading it, would really make sure that pensions are stabilized and that people will be able to retire at the age of 67, as promised, with the same amount, uh, percentually, of I income that they're getting now. Okay. Um, so on those two issues, they did go head to head. There were a few other areas where they disagreed. But what was fascinating is the level of detailed back and forth conversation amongst them on a lot of issues where they were, uh, you could say, they could govern very well together. Yeah, I mean, it, it felt like the, a grand coalition will be born again. <laughs> well, we'll see. Uh, as I said before, these are, in, Mrs. Merkel, in essence, is also another shade of social democrat, mm -hmm. and uh, that showed during the discussion, but I think uh, if you looked at what uh, Mr. Schulz had to do, Mrs. Merkel is ahead in, in terms of credibility, is ahead in terms of competence that voters ascribe uh, to her, and she was largely ahead in terms of likability. And Mr. Schulz had to narrow this gap, at least. And I think M Mrs. Merkel came across as competent, as likable, and, uh, but Mr. Schulz also came, as, uh, came across as a plausible alternative who was able to challenge the record of, uh, of Mrs. Merkel on some key issues, on how she conducted the refugee policy. It's not a large disagreement, but she, he said, like, uh, you don't conduct, uh, you didn't conduct this very well. Also, he was able to attack her credibility with a fairly smart line on pensions uh, when he compared her promise that there won't be a highway toll uh, if she continues to govern what she said four years ago. And uh, she's like, oh, that's about the credibility you'll get uh, with Mrs. Merkel, which was, you know, he had a... He had a tough act because he couldn't be, come across as aggressive. He needed to be likable and still be able to challenge her. And I think he pulled that off uh, he pulled pretty that well. Off. But when we, before the debate, we went in um, saying that most people said this was make or break for Martin Schultz, that he had to really almost pull off a miracle if he wants to change the prospects for his party on election day. Did he turn out to be a miracle worker tonight? I would say no. I think on one of his very core issues, he didn't get one of his main messages across, and that's social justice mm -hmm. and inequality. He started out 
pretty strong on that issue. He was trying to essentially assess how much more money a middle uh, class or even lower middle class family would take home if all of the SPD policies were to go into effect. But that uh, reply that you uh, talked about on the subject of the highway toll, this is mm -hmm. a long issue in mm -hmm. Germany. It's rather abstruse. Unfortunately, they got hijacked by that. Mm -hmm. And he never got around to really outlining the very progressive tax policies that his party advocates that are uh, definitely far more aimed at uh, at remedying inequality than what the CDU was talking it about. Was, and I think that was a loss for him. He didn't deliver what he needed to deliver mm. on that social justice, key area of competence for his party. I'm afraid he didn't do what he had to do there. And how is it possible that he, that he did not do that? I mean, he had the chance to hammer that point, but he didn't do it. Well, he, he made some points uh, on, on pensions, for example, and in his final statement, also when they talked about the diesel scandal, he <clears throat> put this point across that uh, managers, if they may, may make mistakes, they should be called to, uh, called to account, mm -hmm. and uh, that the wage gap between managers and nurses, that that needs to narrow and that we need more social justice. So he, he did his best, but he couldn't perform a miracle without Mrs. Merkel imploding. Mrs. Merkel didn't right. implode. She came across as competent, as at ease, but I think the, at the very least, Mrs. Mr. Schulz had to stabilize his campaign. Four years ago, the moderators asked the challengers of Ms. Mrs. Merkel, uh, do you have, she asked Mrs. Merkel, they asked Mrs. Merkel, do you have pity with my challenger? Mm -hmm. They didn't ask Mr. Schulz that tonight and, they, and, and there's no reason to ask that because he stabilized his campaign. He also wants to enhance his chances that he stays on as SPD chairman after the election. So I think uh, he achieved the very minimum in terms of what, uh, what he had to achieve where the voters actually know more about what the next government will actually deliver right. in terms of future issues, I'm not entirely sure because they didn't ask anything about on Eurozone. They didn't ask anything on Russia, Russia and European, uh, European security. <clears throat> uh, China didn't play a role, although uh, and the debate was largely illiterate on the economic mm. front, uh, but that's mostly due to the moderators. What we did see is, uh, I looked at the clock as they were finishing up mm -hmm. on migration. Interestingly enough, they spent half of the entire allotted time on migration. And a lot of that was looking backward. Some of it, of course, was on integration and what do we do about uh, um, Islamist pre uh, uh, the imams who are uh, preaching Hate. things that are counter to our <clears throat> values. All of that was interesting, but on most of that, they were more or less in and in, in their agreement. closing mm -hmm. in their closing statements. Mr. Schulz talked about a new departure to conquer the future, and uh, Mrs. Merkel talked about a curiosity, you know, in terms of that she has, in terms of shaping the future. But during the debate, one didn't get much of a sense from either of the candidates in terms of what they really. For. We, we, we've said earlier that the, in the past elections that uh, Ms. Merkel didn't do very well in the debates. Debating is not her strong point. Would you say that this debate tonight was the strongest performance she's ever given in a debate? I felt that she was at least to some degree a little more present mm -hmm. uh, than one often sees her. She didn't simply repeat her talking points and kind of uh, do that Teflon thing that we have so, uh, so often seen her in the past. And, and you could see every now and then there were facial uh, expressions. Yeah, yeah. that she was certainly catching Martin Schulz's eye. And there was that amazing moment where they were talking about the diesel scandal mm -hmm. uh, due to the fact that uh, Volkswagen uh, faked uh, the numbers on diesel emissions of its cars. And now, you know, what happens to all of these people who have cars that, that don't meet regulations and that need to be in some way retooled? retooled. And, uh, and so Martin Schulz thinks that needs to happen partly through class action lawsuits mm -hmm. uh, from car owners in order to give them more leverage against the big automotive companies. And she said to him, uh, listen, Let's talk to the justice minister and see if we can get this worked on faster. That was fascinating because, uh, you know, for both of us, yeah, right. looking at uh, debates uh, in the U.S., yeah. can you imagine no. a Republican and a Democratic uh, politician 
in the U.S. saying to each other, hey, you know, let's get together and uh, let's call uh, the, the Secretary of, of Justice and see what we can do. Yeah, I, you, you can't imagine that, but, but I wonder, and, and I think that what we saw tonight also was, was refreshing, right, based on, on what we've seen in, with U.S. Um, politics in the last year. But at the end of the day, does it make a difference with the voters? Do, do the voters have more clarity tonight in terms of two candidates, two parties, bringing two very different plans to the table. Do they? I'd say no. Uh, but they, they didn't assume that these were two very, very different offerings to begin with. And everybody knows that in Germany. Uh, and uh, voters can also, as we discussed in the beginning, they can choose another party. They can choose a neo-fascist alternative for Germany. They can choose an economically liberal party. They can choose an ec ecological party. And uh, if they are bored with uh, what was on offer, but at least they got uh, presented two competent candidates. If either of them becomes chancellor, they can be sure that Germany will be, be, be governed in a very calm and competent uh, kind of way. Well, and uh, as you said, that's fairly refreshing t compared yeah, to is. the alternatives that we saw in France or the alternatives that uh, that we saw in the, in the US. So I think we shouldn't necessarily complain that we didn't get enough of populist uh, alternatives no, it, uh, tonight. In fact, I was about to say it was the opposite of populism. Certainly on that debate about uh, Islamist uh, uh, dangers stemming uh, from mosques in Germany with uh, imams who are perhaps being funded by Turkey or Saudi Arabia and right. who are preaching uh, very... Uh, Islamist ideologies and have not been adequately controlled in the past. Mm -hmm. So that section of the debate started out with the moderator saying 62% of Germans feel that Islam doesn't belong to Germany. It is not really a part of, the, of, of this country's culture. And for people who feel strongly that way, they will not have heard from either candidate here reassuring words that give them the sense, I think, that their fears are really understood. Yeah. There were very nuanced answers. This was an interesting, you could say, almost pedagogic exercise on the part of the two candidates to perhaps try to convince voters that they need to take a more nuanced view. But I am sure that they did not win back anyone who is leaning toward the <clears throat> far-right AFD party. Yeah, and I, I want us to talk about that possibility in just a second. Um, but we do have some data coming in now. Um, people were asked halfway through the debate who they thought was winning. 44% said that Merkel was winning at halftime. 32% said that Schultz was winning at halftime. I mean, that is a, a sizable difference, but the difference there is not as, as big as maybe we would have thought. Well, and also, we're talking about halftime. They were actually just finished with migration at that point. They had not gone on to social justice, and I believe that the Turkey section also came after that. Schultz began to look stronger when he was talking about how to deal with Turkey. And that is when he really did go on the offensive, uh, I think, uh, in his remarks about, about Erdogan, in his remarks about Trump, in his remarks about North Korea and Kim Jong-un. Now, you could counter that it's easy for the person the who outsider. is not in government yeah. to say we need tougher talk and we need to break off uh, membership talks. And the chancellor again and again tried to gently lead voters to the conclusion that she is the penultimate crisis manager, that she is the one who uh, essentially has again and again proved that she uh, can talk to lots of different parties and get them uh, on track when it comes to dealing with major international crises. So she may well have countered on some of that, but I think he did look stronger in some sections of the second half okay. uh, of the debate. We're um, running out of time here, but the question of the debate that I think a lot of people will remember tonight, and both candidates were asked, did they go to church this Sunday? Did, we, you know, we chuckled at the answer, at the question, but what did it tell us about the candidates themselves and the fact that it surprised them? 
Because usually candidates don't share these kind of personal matters uh, in, in debates. Although religion uh, was a big part of the debate tonight, the topic of yes, religion. Yes, but personal religiosity is usually not a big issue, unlike, unlike US politics, whether you go to church or whether you're religious yourself, mm -hmm. voters don't care so much. And But it was interesting, it was a curious moment, because Mrs. Merkel, after she said, no, uh, I wasn't in church, then Mr. Schulz said, I, I went to a chapel and uh, it's true, yes. to visit uh, my deceased friend, uh, Frank Schirmacher. Yes. Then uh, Mrs. Merkel felt compelled uh, as the head of the CDU in an eager beaver kind of way to say, oh yeah, but I was in church yesterday. So it was more yeah. a curious. If uh, anything, you saw that they react with the same kind of uh, mechanism. Uh, they had a very similar reaction. And I think throughout the debate, you saw two pretty pragmatically inclined nuanced thinkers, neither of them got loud, neither mm -hmm. of them really got angry. It was, uh, I think if anything, they're kind of like a matched set. Yeah, so if we have to pick a winner, who would you say the winner was? Was it Angela Merkel or was it Martin Schulz? Forced? In terms of prior expectations, I would say it was Schulz because he outperformed uh, expectations, but Merkel was solid. Uh, she's in general, I think, a solid debater as an incumbent, she's a very weak debater as a challenger. That's why she was very weak with uh, Schroeder in her first debate. But mm -hmm. as an incumbent, her style serves her very well. Uh, she came across as calm, competent, likable. So, uh, but uh, Melinda, Mr. Schultz you, did the same, I think. What do you say, Melinda? Hard for me to come out black and white on this. I would say she was stronger on some issues. Uh, he exhibited strengths on others. Uh, she went in with a bonus, and he certainly did not close the gap uh, to the degree that he may need to. He may get a little boost of momentum out of this, uh, but I think it'll probably uh, dissipate fairly soon. All right. All right, Melinda Crane and Torsten Benner, to both of you, thank you very much. It was... Um, a an enjoyable time watching the debate with you. Thank you. Thank you.